Hi there, this is Sergio Seiss with the uh, Real Estate Hedgehog um, it's a podcast, podcast number 26. So glad that you guys are able to join us today. Uh, we've got a, a, a special guest today, but first of all, I want to check with my buddy, Sam. Sam, how are things going with you today? Uh, things are doing pretty good with me. You know, I'm back in town officially. I'm not going anywhere. My kid's going to go back into school in about uh, another two weeks. How about you? No, doing great. Uh, you know, for our people that follow us, they know that we've uh, opened escrow on a property out in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and we're going through the due diligence process right now, uh, looking for a lender to uh, work with us. And eventually we're going to be looking for some investors to come in on this deal with us. We think it's a great deal. It is in Kansas City. So uh, it's not a real big deal. So for people that are wanting to kind of get their toe wet uh, going out of a uh, state, this might be a great way to do it. So we'll keep everybody posted. But what I want to do today is uh, just let everybody know that we do have a special guest. And that's uh, Rick Perillo, uh, a friend of mine who actually is a classmate of my son. So Rick uh, went to high school with my son, David. And you know, it's amazing. Uh, I know Sam right now, you've got little kids, right? How old is the oldest one for you, Sam? So my oldest one is 13. I got three kids. 13. Yeah. My youngest is 35, okay? <laughs> and then, of course, my son, David, 38, who is, a, like I said, a classmate of Rick. So, Rick, how are you doing, buddy? What's been going on with you? Uh, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing great. I took the day off work and went and shot some bows and arrows today. Oh, with the kids or with just by no, yourself? No, I was by myself. <laughs> okay. Excellent. That was some me time. Well, good. Well, Rick, tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a little history, maybe a one or two minute bio, as it were. Sure. Um, I, I was uh, born and raised in the Los Angeles area. Uh, I am 39. I, I consider myself a newer real estate investor. Um, I own the home I live in, an ADU attached to that home, and then a single family home in Indianapolis and a single family home in Huntsville, Alabama. And by profession, I am a teacher. I teach uh, edible gardening to kids. Oh, wow. So is this like a grammar school, high school? What do you do? I, I teach everyone from two year olds to seniors in high school. So I work at a school where they all have gardening as a regular part of their curriculum. So um, like once a week, every kid will come to me and we'll grow food and we'll learn to harvest it and cook with it. That's interesting. Yeah, uh, that is quick. cool, man. I, I've yeah, never yeah. heard of that. And uh, you know what? Uh, for the uh, the listeners and the viewers, I kind of know Rick through uh, Sergio, but I didn't know that you had archery as a hobby. That's actually pretty cool, man. <laughs> it's a new, that's a newer hobby. That's what I'm kind of learning right now. Excellent. So real quickly, how did you get started with this whole um, agriculture thing or whatever you want to call it? Uh, after, after it was after I finished college, you know, like like many people didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I, I ended up traveling in New Zealand for three months uh -huh. and I worked on farms there. And I kind of got like room and board in exchange for working part of the day on the farm. And um, I fell in love with it. I just fell in love with agriculture and the farm life and came back to Los Angeles and started taking classes and just gardening and learning it. And at the same time, um, I think as a nation, we were kind of looking at how kids were eating and the foods in schools, how, how bad they were. So there started to be these positions opening for like, hey, come, come teach the kids gardening, like kind of like this, let's get back to nature, back to good health. So I kind of came in teaching it like in after school programs, things like that. And eventually it led to this position I have now where I do this full time teach gardening the kids. Excellent, excellent. Who would have thunk it that a, I'm not going to say you're an inner city kid because you're not, but you did grow up in the city, not in, yeah. a, in the country or farm. And yeah. here you are. That's, that's great. That's great. You know what? I will say that you, you're at another level. I, I've, I've just <laughs> elevated you to the next ring of respect because, you know, I too am a, I'm a big time garden guy. You know, I grow a lot of the stuff in the yard. I've got a bunch of yeah. chickens in the yard. I've been doing this in three different properties, but never like, professionally it was just kind of playing around yeah. you know with the the usual stuff tomatoes lettuce and stuff yeah, like that i didn't know that about you sam either i i have chickens too we'll have to talk talk chickens oh yeah time. man I, at one point i've had over 70 chickens wow. right now okay, I'm that's probably, like a small business <laughs> yeah i'm probably right now around uh, 30 to 40 but you oh. know as they hatch we give away some we you know we kill some yeah. um and obviously we get their eggs and uh 
I've gone through many tractors to, to till the yard and keep things up. So yeah, I do like it. It keeps, I think, um, you know how they say it's therapy? To me, it's yeah. therapy. When I'm out there and I oh, get yeah. into it, I don't focus on anything else. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I never realized I had such, so many, such, you know, country guys here. That's amazing. <laughs> That's great. Well, so uh, uh, so Rick, tell us, how did you get started with real estate? How, how did it all begin for you? Um, it, it began, so I, I bought, the first property I bought was the house I live in. I bought that in 2019. But it certainly didn't start there. Probably started five years before that. I was actually talking to a friend who um, was a realtor. And he started talking about this idea of like, buying properties for, you know, $150,000, $200,000, renting them out, the renter pays the mortgage. Um, And and then after a couple of years, you know, pull equity and and do it again. And he was looking at the time at kind of, kind of where Sam invest, I think, like in Riverside and areas like that, he was looking at doing that. And and it kind of blew my mind because like, I, I just wasn't raised with people who kind of thought like that in terms of like, you can use your money to invest and use your money to make money for you. Um, and, and this idea that you can get a house and someone else can pay it off for you. I mean, it, it, it was something I never thought of and it just captivated me that idea. Um, and at the time I was kind of looking at ways like recognizing, you know, I love my work. I love the work I do, but I'm going to need more financial security than, than it provides. Um, and, and, you know, at the time I didn't have kids, but I knew one day I would want to have kids. And eventually I don't want to do the whole thing where I just worked on 65 and then collect my retirement. Like I, that, that wasn't speaking to me, this idea of like, Hey, you don't have to do that. You might be able to stop working way before you're 65. And, and when I heard this idea of real estate, I just knew like that, that was the quickest, most efficient way to achieve that. So again, that was about five years before I bought a house. So at that point, my wife and I, you know, we had credit, I think we had about $30,000 in credit card debt. We were renting an apartment, we had car debt. Um, So we just got to work on like first step, cleaned up all that debt. Um, And then we decided to really accelerate our savings. We need to do a little sacrifice here and we need to go live with our parents. So we moved in with my wife's parents for two years where we just put aside a ton of money. And, and I know not everyone has that option, but like we basically, we used what resources we had. So we, we did that for two years, put away a lot of money. Uh, after that, bought a home. And, and we, when we bought our home, we knew we would create a rental on that property. So as soon as we bought our home, we instantly turned our 400 square foot garage into a studio apartment um, and started renting that out at $1,600 a month. I, I'm in LA, so rents are high. That's what a studio uh, rents here for. Um, right after that, we still had some savings. So we started looking at a state, just knowing in Southern California, prices were appreciating so fast and we weren't going to be able to afford a down payment on a home in Southern California. So we started looking at the Midwest. Uh, we bought a house in Indianapolis. And then after we bought that within a year, we, we had no cash to buy another home. I actually pulled money out of my retirement because again, I'm not thinking anymore in times of, in terms of like 401k and social security. I'm thinking in terms of real estate and that that is my retirement. So I pulled money out of my retirement to um, about five months ago, purchase a nice. house in Huntsville, Got a couple of questions Alabama. for you. That uh, the house that you bought, the first house that you bought, the one that I suspect you still live in, right? Yes. How much did you pay for that? We paid, uh, so this is 2019 and it was $550,000. Okay, excellent. So 550,000. Yeah, 5% five percent down because we were five, oh. living it, so 5%. Yeah, and Sam and I ta- have talked about how uh, how important it is to be able to, for a first time buyer to be a first time buyer and take advantage of the programs yeah. that are out there because so what did you put down? Like about thirty thousand dollars, or a little less than that? Yeah, yeah, I think it was roughly that, if I remember right. Yeah, and that's excellent. And then the ADU, you built the ADU. Yes. And, um, uh, and I know that it was very fortunate because did the I guess I suspect the law had changed already for you could build ADUs, right? So it's like it happened. The, the timing was great for you, right? It, it what well, LA basically wants people, all of California really wants people to build these because housing is so short. So they, they just loosened a lot of the restrictions, the, the code coding restrictions to make it a lot easier to get a, your plans approved and get permitted. And so the, the money from the ADU, where'd that come from? 
So I, I took a family loan for that that I'm paying off. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. And how much how much at the did you cost you? About seventy five thousand. Okay, so let me. I'm gonna do some real quick math right now. So you are rough getting roughly a twenty five percent or so return on that money. Yeah, yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, I think like in Southern California where prices are so high and rents are high too, but it's it's really hard to cash flow in Southern California. I think this is the way to do it. You have you have to like build ADs. Uh, the, uh, the house across from me sold about a year ago and the person turned a Seagull family home into it basically a triplex. And um, I talked to those renters and found out what they're paying. All together, they're generating like $6,000 in rent from what was a single family home turned into a, a triplex. So I think that's the way you do it in Southern California is you have to build on your property. Excellent. Um, so did, did any time after you build the ADU and get it rented out, did you get the house reevaluated to see what kind of equity did it generate just from putting in that seventy seventy five thousand dollars of investment? Yeah, I, I I did. I refin when interest rates got real low during COVID. I refinanced, but I didn't pull cash. I just just straight refinanced to um, lower my interest rate and get rid of PMI. So the ADU helped helped bump me up from you know I bought it with five percent down within a year because of Southern California appreciation and that ADU, I had like over 20% equity so I could refinance out of PMI. I think I actually talked to that appraiser at the time. He said the ADUs were kind of blowing up. Everyone was doing them. And he just basically said the appraisers are having a very difficult time appraising them appropriately because it's so kind of new. It's hard to find comps with the yeah. ADUs. But um, on the low, we paid seventy five thousand. On the low end, it adds fifty thousand dollars to the property. That's kind of just for very conservative calculations. I use on the on the high end. I think it could add as much as a hundred thousand dollars to the properties. I see some houses in my neighborhood that build them for selling for quite a bit over what other houses are selling for as much as a hundred thousand. But your but your base value had risen enough that it was able to be refinanced with twenty percent equity to drop your mortgage insurance right yeah exactly so i went for within a year went from five percent equity to well over 20 percent equity Very nice. because of the ADU and appreciation so you know one of the things i like i love about your story is that you and your wife made a decision that you were going to do a particular thing in this case save up money for real estate and you, you said you used all the resources available to you um you know you saved up your money you paid off your debt you even moved in with your wife's parents what were aside from raising money because everyone has that challenge uh which and, and you just kind of have to figure it out right you just have to figure it out yeah. you did it sam has done it i've done it we have a lot of people uh in our group that have just figured it out they will get a second job they go do something right but what were some of the other challenges that you kind of faced besides just having to raise the money yeah I think when you're new, making decisions and sticking to them. So when I say my story, it might sound like a linear story, but but it was far from linear. Like I think a year, a year or two before we even bought the house we lived in, we weren't sure we would even buy a house to live in. Like we thought maybe we'll start buying out of state properties and not even and keep renting in LA. Um, we drove out to Vegas with the realtor and looked at condos in Vegas, like $150,000 condos, and even offered on some um and got rejected and in retrospect i'm i'm glad we did get rejected um and, you know and then we kind of started thinking okay maybe that's not the best move um eventually we decided it's better to get a house here and then i mentioned like you know i went to indianapolis and i bought a property and a lot of people asked me like well why indianapolis why huntsville and i i think they kind of want me to say like well here's the secret no one knows about these cities that i know but it's not like that. America is full of cities and, and full of great cities. And there's probably cities that are better to invest in than the ones I did. But like ultimately, and, and I've talked, I, I've extensively looked at um, Dallas, Texas and made offers on properties there. And I've looked at all sorts of cities and talked to realtors in all sorts of cities. And it, it, that my path was never linear. It's always looking at a lot of different stuff. But eventually there's something and it might not be perfect, but it's like eventually you just have to like not overanalyze and just see like, okay, this city, this team I have in that city, this property, 
work for my numbers. There may be a better investment out there I'm missing out on, but like this works and, and just commit and, and go with it. So I think it was just, that's always been a challenge, especially when we were new and we just didn't know a lot. Like, are we making the right decision right now? I, I don't know. This is, this is scary to buy this, you know? Um, so it's really just like making those decisions. So what I'm getting out of this, you know, for the listeners that are kind of on the sidelines and listening and watching and researching, what I'm getting out of what you just said is that leading up to it, you weren't just sitting idle and just only educating yourself. You're out there contacting numerous agents anywhere that kind of fits your uh, financial criteria because you just said you got rejected a few times, but you kept going. And I think I want to highlight how important that is because that's really the secret is that you can't just sit idle and hope it comes to you. You have to make those offers, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and then even then when you're kind of committed to a place like in Indianapolis, I, I would uh, talk to a realtor on the phone to kind of see if we could work together, have a great conversation. And then, you know, they're like, okay, I'm gonna start sending you properties. And then, and then they never do. Um, and then when you finally do find a realtor to work with, so, so both of our out-of-state properties we bought during the last two years during COVID where the housing market was insane. Um, we got offer after offer rejected um, and just kept getting told things like you lost to an all cash offer. We have 40 offers on this house. We've never seen so many. I mean, this would have been like, I think we got into this in the most competitive time, but it's just being persistent, like keep going at it. And also I think willing to be flexible with your criteria. Like when we got to Indianapolis property, we said, okay, I really want a house under $200,000 because we don't want to like drop all of our savings on this. And um, so we're making offers, getting rejected, making offers, getting rejected. And, you know, start realizing that price range, 150 to 200,000 was extremely competitive. Everyone was looking in that range. So we had to say, okay, can we go up to 250? Um, it's a stretch for us, but we did. And as soon as we kind of expanded our criteria, we, we landed a great, a great property. So I think that too, just like you, you should have your criteria, but can't be completely fixated on it there has to be some flexibility to your criteria excellent so you know you mentioned a little bit about getting scared a couple of times the fear how did you guys what did you and your wife do to kind of overcome that yeah i think talk to you sergio oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking what did good, i tell you good huh? answer that was a perfect <laughs> answer what did i tell you i can't even remember what i told you <laughs> uh, but no, I, I think that is a huge help to um so if, if you're not raised, which I, 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 there was no one in my family invested in real estate. No, so, you know, no one did that. So it's kind of like, you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't grow up seeing certain things, you just don't know it's a, it's a thing. Um, but like, once I started meeting you guys and, 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 you know, talking to you guys and other people and seeking that, and when, and when you seek it out, you'll find it. Like if you're seeking out a mentor, you'll find them and seem like, Hey, look, it can be done. Like, it's not so scary, you know, and everyone will tell you things like, you tell them you're buying a house. Well, isn't that risky? Everyone's got 2008 in their memory. Like, what, what if there's a crash? And, you know, that stuff could, you know, it's your mindset that could get to you. But I think if you're kind of talking to people who have done it and are doing it, reading books by people that have done it and are doing it, that goes a long way to like remind you, you know, they can do it and I can do it. People do do this. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, you know what? Sam and I talk a lot about that, the, the fear, because I, I really believe that especially when you get out of your comfort zone, you know, fear is going to come right back. So mm -hmm. if you feel comfortable with single family homes, that's great. And also when you're buying a fourplex and also when you're going, Ugh, you know, or you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're good with small family home. And all of a sudden you're, you're, you decide to take the plunge into commercial property. And now you've got a, you know, 15, 16, 20 units. And then mm -hmm. you get that same feeling in your stomach. Like, Ugh. But it's just a feeling of not being comfortable. You're out of your yeah. comfort zone. Right. And I, I mean, for Sam and I, I know our careers have been one constant getting out of one comfort zone after another yeah. continuously. So I think it's just a question of knowing and recognizing that, that that fear is just because you're out of your comfort zone and then just going forward anyways. So I mean, what, what do you think, Sam? Do you think that's true? I, I think it's very true. I will tell you, for me, I'm always afraid. It's always fearful. But what lets me or keeps me going or allows me to go is always thinking about 
how few fearful I was the last time and how did that turn out? So I tell myself, well, you know, we'll be fine. Obviously, you know, I, I really do believe in reserves. As I get further along into my journey, I feel that it is so important. Now, mind you, I took some risks where I used up everything to the limit in hopes that time will build it back. But if anything happened immediately, oh man, I was, I was pushing, you know, I was really pushing the line, but that's more of a risk tolerance. I did want to go back. So on this last property that you purchased, you had mentioned something earlier at the intro that you had pulled money out of your retirement savings. Was that what was used to purchase it? For the most part, that was, yeah, what, what was our down payment. Let, let me ask you this, and this is for those who do have retirement savings. Um, you know, I have a small retirement savings that I'm more than willing to take money out to use to invest because like you, I plan on using real estate to be the primary, um, you know, income for my retirement. My question to you is, do you see that currently what you just did, you're generating money on that investment equal to or greater than what you were getting when you had it in that account? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, yeah, and that's, and, and, that, that's, and that's a big pretty, thing. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a financial advisor and would never want to advise anyone, hey, take your retirement out. Like that's, yeah. you know, that's security. And, and, and to be honest, my wife has one, so we do have one. But um, yeah, I mean, that's a big decision. And like you said, it's it's risk tolerance. I have a fairly high risk tolerance, but um, it, it is working very well for us, that decision. Like it's definitely outpacing the stock market. Yeah. The, so the, where do you see yourself now? Because it sounds like, you grew really fast in a really short period of time. You got your home in 2019. You built an ABU right away. It generated great income, refinanced, took out the PMI, saved you quite a bit of money. And by 2020, 2021, now we're in 2022, you've already picked up two more out-of-state properties as rentals. Now, where are we going to go from here? What do you see? Yeah, that, so that's exactly what I'm spending some time figuring out right now. I mean, th this is addicting. Like, I, I want to keep going. Um, right now, we're not really in a great position to to buy right away, and we're at a point where we need to get more creative with our with how we're going to finance these. So, I've been evaluating my Indianapolis property. So, we've owned it. Um, actually, our renters just moved out. We we just finished our first cycle of a year of renters. Um, in that year year, that, that house is already appreciated by $50,000. So I was already at a point I'm exploring like, wow, can I take my entire down payment out already by refinancing it? At which point it's, it's like I never paid. It's like I got a free home. It would be like, I, I never paid anything for that house. I basically put $40,000 into that home. I'm looking at like, I might be able to take 40,000 out of it now. I don't, I don't think it's quite there where I'm comfortable doing that, but that's kind of what I'm hoping is I could pay a little bit more of it down and hoping it'll appreciate a little bit more. And then I'll be looking at pulling money out of that to buy something else. I, I would certainly like to start scaling it to multifamilies, a duplex or triplex or fourplex. Um, so I'm going to be looking at that, but yeah, I'm just right now figuring out how to finance all that. So, so that's a great strategy. I know that uh, Sam has used that strategy to really grow his, uh, his real estate portfolio. So absolutely do that. And then the other thing I would recommend is that, and you're doing it already, you're looking for properties. Don't worry about the fact that you don't have enough money because there are always people that would love to have someone like you find the property and then say, yeah, I'll, I'll put in 30, 40, 50,000 on that if I can partner up with you. you know. And like on the property that Sam and I right now just recently opened, escrow on that, I mean, that's exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, we're going to open it up to other people. And, you know, I mean, we might bring in four or five, maybe six people on the deal, but uh, on a smaller deal, we might want to bring in one or two, because I think I really believe that just having that property under management, as it were, can bring a lot of value and a lot of wealth over time, because you really stop, you don't, you, you know, you don't use your, your own money really that much. You know, think about it on a $2 million property, if you could put down $50,000, bring in the rest of the money from other folks that just want to, you know, uh, I don't want to say take advantage, but to take advantage of what you, the work that you've done and still get a good return. 
now you've got, okay, wow, $50,000 is controlling $2 million. How does that happen? And of course, there's yeah. ways of getting paid for that. And, and you know, nothing's for free. You, you get paid for the time and effort that you put into. So just something to kind of keep in mind as you're, as you're starting to look and explore. But uh, that's, a great, that's a great story. Uh, I love the fact how you started. I love how much you've learned. Like you said, you, when you don't know, you don't know, right? You don't even know that things are things, right? Um, and I know that was true for Sam. It was true for me. We all learn it in our own time. But uh, any, any closing statements or questions you want to ask Sam before we uh, close this, uh, this interview up? No, I think uh, I think right now, based on what we just heard, it basically kind of uh, epitomizes what mindset you have to have to step into the game, right? Because from what we're hearing in just a few short years, he was able to do it. He was able to scale up pretty quickly. I mean, if you think about it really carefully in just a few short years, he has technically three properties, three rentals because of the ADU. He lives in one. But to get to that point was commitment, the commitment to say, okay, this is the plan. I'm going to do it. I'm going to move in with my parents. That sacrifice, I think most of us, we have to do, especially if you don't have anything to start out with. And I think we've all done it. But hearing that, I hope that the viewers know that it's not impossible. It can be done. It can be done at any time. Even right now, like you said, the market is so competitive, but that persistence got you there. And the reality is, even if it wasn't competitive, and, and I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but based on the story I've heard just now, that really is the limit of what you were gotten anyways. So basically, financially, you, you maximized what your potential is in that short time span, even in a competitive market, because of your commitment and persistence. You know? so, so one last question before we sign off, uh, uh, Rick. How much total equity do you think you have as a result of the properties that you've acquired since 2019? If you just just um, round, just a round number, just a nice round. Yeah, I, I mean, including the house I I live in, because that's sure. in, that's in Southern California, so that's the majority. But um, right. a, a, a somewhere between three and four hundred thousand. So in three, basically nineteen, what nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Yeah, so three. in about three and a half years, what did you say? Three to four hundred. Yeah, yeah. Thousand? closer to four hundred thousand. Closer to four hundred thousand. Yeah. So almost a hundred thousand dollars a year yeah. in equity. And, it, and it's going to be the foundation that's going to continue to grow yeah. for you. That's that's I amazing. I mean, I don't know where else you can do that. And I know Sam has had tremendous growth. I mean, I'm not going to ask him because he'll just I'll just be embarrassed by how little <laughs> yeah, I've grown. No, but, <laughs> I think uh, I will tell you based on the story Rick just told, it is envious for anybody. Yeah. Think about it real carefully when you look at your group of friends around you, right? I mean, how many people do you know? Now, granted, we all hang out with different groups of friends, but I can tell you my group of friends that I go have a drink with now and then or hang out with on the phone and go on trips with, I don't know that many people who has that level of commitment. Yeah. So from what I just heard from Rick right now, that is beyond a respectable level of commitment, but it is something that you know it could be achievable and it's basically the blueprint that's put out there by every book and, and every podcast and every forum. There's no secret, but you need to have that commitment. And I think uh, I'm only guessing here, you have a, a spouse that's well committed too, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's my, my business partner. So uh, yeah, you had to, I think you both have to be on board. So you Oh yeah, that's the board. wild card uh, for anybody. Yeah. Any yeah. married person <laughs> who's watching or listening that's your wild card. But if both of you are committed, I think really anything is achievable because you're averaging equity wise, a hundred thousand a year of growth. That's amazing. I know I can't save that much every year, right? Very few people can. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you know what, Rick, thank you so much for joining us. I, uh, you know what, I'm looking forward to actually doing business with you in the next several years, because I know that you do have the same sort of commitment level that Sam and I do. And it's just a question of time for those opportunities to come up. And uh, I know at some point we'll be doing business together. So that's so great. So thank you for your time. Uh, Sam, uh, let people know how to get a hold of us, please. Oh yeah, so if you guys want, uh, well, if you, if you like what you just saw, what you heard, I hope you uh, click that like button, subscribe to our channel so you get notified. And um, you know what, you can contact us. We do put out a weekly newsletter 
uh, to get a hold of us, just send us a quick email. It's going to be at realestatehedgehog at gmail.com. That's realestatehedgehog at gmail.com. Just say, hey, I saw your video. I'd love to be on this, uh, this weekly newsletter. Follow our journey. We talk about a lot of little things, give you some tips and tidbits. And uh, if you want to take a look at more of what we do uh, between Sergio and I, you can go to hedgehogcapitalinvestments.com. And that's also where we store a lot of video and past articles if you want to catch up. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. And we'll catch the uh, catch everybody else at uh, next week's podcast. Take care. Cool. Hey, Rick, thanks for, for coming on, man. It was a great story. And uh, I'd love to talk to you later about that farming stuff because that's what I love. Yeah, thank you both.